Jim Zogby from the Arab American Institute, for those of you who are on this campus and not from, uh, from our institute conference. And we're pleased to be here at the University of Michigan Dearborn to host both this session and uh, Governor Martin O'Malley, who comes next. Uh, before I introduce um, the folks who are here, I just want to give a, um, um, a bit of an introduction to the, to the idea. Um, Annie, Annie Sovic this morning at the um, session that we had with folks who had just come back uh, and who work on a regular basis with um, the refugees in Jordan and Lebanon and in, in, in Turkey, um, made an observation that stuck with me. Uh, she, she talked about the folks who experience what they do and are forced to become refugees and, and ask the question of what does it take to uproot yourself, to uproot your children, um, give up everything you have, um, and leave. How painful, how difficult an experience that is to do everything for survival a survival of your family, not just yourself. Um, I think about that a lot. My father came over as an undocumented person in 1923. Um, and I remember the stories. I remember him hiding and telling stories about being in hiding and, um, and then him starting a business and getting amnesty and then getting citizenship. And um, uh, I never looked at him as, as undocumented. I never looked at him even as an immigrant. I looked at him as a hero. Um, I tell that to cab drivers all the time in Washington when I meet these guys and, and I ask them first thing, I say, where are you from? Why'd you come? Uh, tell me where your family is and they tell me and these are guys who were like had degrees back in Ethiopia uh, or working in, in high level positions in Nigeria um, and give it all up to come here because they want their kids to live in freedom with opportunity. And I tell them, you're not immigrants, you're not refugees, you're heroes. And so. Um, what we have today are, are three heroes. We have people who have made the extraordinary sacrifice, um, given that it was imposed upon them. Not easy. Not easy when, in fact, their bombs are falling all around. But to make the decision to leave and to risk it all to save your family is a big deal. And I want to have them talk to us because I think sometimes we, this gets lost in the conversation. We think about it as, um, um, as uh, sheer numbers. We think about it in, in kind of ways that don't do justice to the real people. Um, I said this morning that when we look at Imran Kurdi, it doesn't matter whether he's Kurdish or Arab or Christian or Muslim. He's a three-year-old. He shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have died that way, but he didn't have to be there at all. And the question is, who's going to take care of him? Because at the end of the day, these are all our kids. They're not their kids or their kids. They're our kids. These are our people. And so when I hear the, if they come, what are they going to do to our jobs? Or what are they going to do to, if they don't come, what's it going to do to our soul? And that's the issue that we've got to confront. How do we change this discourse? How do we create a shared discourse of pain and understanding to replace the fear? That's ultimately what we have to do, and that's why we're doing this session today. Um, I have, we have three folks with us. Um, I'm going to start with, with Noor, Noor Abdabag. And I thank you for joining us, Noor. Noor is a Chaldean from Iraq, and uh, she arrived in January of 2014. Correct. Thank you. My name is Noor Adabba. I speak today, I, I, I speak Arabic today. I'm Noor Adabba, I'm 30 years old, and I have two children. We came to America in January 2014. My name is Noor, um, I'm 30 years old. I have a husband and two kids. We came um, to the United States in January of 2014 from Iraq. احنا انا جيت فيزيتر للامريكا اخذنا الفيزا الامريكيه من العراق على ثلاث مراحل كانت اول مره المقابله الي والابني حصلت انا ابروفد على الفيزا بس ابني اجاني رفض اي دونت نو ليش حصل الرفض ما اعرف 
Um, so it took us a while to um, get here, but we came here um, through a visitor's visa. Um, it took a, it was three stages, um, and for the first interview, she applied her and her son. Her youngest son still wasn't born yet, and um, he, her and her son were um, not approved for um, visa to the United States. بعدين رجعت سويت مقابلة مرة ثانية حصل ابني سويت مقابلة لابني حصل ابني فيزا وراها ب بشهر زوجي هم حصل فيزا وقدرنا نطلع من العراق جانيوري 2014. So after a few months, um, her son got approved, who was a toddler at the time. Her son got approved, um, and then her husband got approved, and finally they were able to leave um, and come to the United States. احنا طلعنا من العراق الاسباب اولا ان زوجي كان مخطوف بال2008 من جماعات ارهابيه أه وقت اللي كان مخطوف أه استخدموا معانه أبشع الطرق بالتعذيب كانما انه يمكن اذا هو يعني مقابيلهم حيوان ولو اعتذر عن هذا اللفظ بس انه هم حتى مع الحيوانات كان يمكن يتصرفون تصرفات احسن كان ينشد بالزنجيل العيون مربوطه بالكيبل أه ضرب أه اهانه يتصلون بينا بالهاتف ويضربونه حتى احنا نقدر إن حتى احنا انه ننقهر علينا اكثر um, so we had to leave because my husband Nassim was kidnapped and um, when he was kidnapped he was treated in um, maybe um, Animals were treated better, and she didn't want to use that language, but animals may have been treated better than her husband. Um, he was uh, tied by chains. He, his eyes were, were in, in a blindfold, and they would call her family so that they could um, listen in on his torture. Um, وراها احنا ما قدرنا نطلع مباشره لان ما كان عندنا فلوس على ما جمعنا فلوس وداينا قدرنا نطلع من العراق وصلنا امريكا احنا كان دخولنا ببوسطن بعدين جينا لميشيغان قدمنا على اسايلم صادف انه بعد مقا... بعد ما حصلنا ال... انه قدمنا على الاسايلم جانا موعد للانترفيو الموعد الانترفيو كان كنت انا حامل فموعد الانترفيو كان يصادف ويا الولاده تبعي فقدم طلبنا انه الدكتور منعني انه اروح للمقابله وسوى لنا ورقه انه لازم ما احضر المقابله ويسوي لنا ريسكجول. So after receiving visa, um, we came to Boston and then we um, left to Michigan. And um, after a month of being here, we applied for asylum. Um, after uh, that application was finished, we got an interview date, but that interview date happened to be the same date as my due date, which she was pregnant with her second child, Dev, at the time. Um, and uh, so we couldn't, we couldn't attend that date. So um, our lawyer sent... Um, sent a, a notice that they couldn't make the interview date, but they, they said that she had failed to, to come to the interview and that pushed back the process of receiving asylum status. بعدين وصلتنا رسالة إنه إحنا فيلر نوتك إنه إحنا جانا رفض لأن إحنا ما وصل للإميغريشن أو الدائرة الأسائلم ورقة تقول إنه إحنا سوينا ريسكجول. بعد مرور سنة تقريبا طبعا بالأسائلم أكو قانون إنه أنت من تسوي الانترفيو أو أو تاريخ تقديم المعاملة أنت ممكن إنه تعد كلوك 150 يوم تقدر تسوي بينه أبلاي على الامبلويمنت أثرايزيشن. Um, so after um, they didn't attend the interview because um, she was heavily pregnant, she استلمنا ورقة إنه إحنا جانا رفض. Okay. توقف لك لوك. Okay. No, no, I got it. Um, so then, um, so there's there's a rule that after the first interview for the asylum, you get 150 days to get a work authorization. Because they didn't attend that interview, the work authorization process was also pushed back. So it took about a year. فتوقف الكلوك بعد مرور سنة تقريبا على تقديمنا المعاملة جتينا أوراق إنه إحنا نقدر نش... إنه نقدر نسوي السكند انترفيو فإحنا طول هاي السنة إحنا كان معنا فلوس الفلوس اللي عدنا انصرفت بهاي السنة إحنا ما حقنا ناخذ لا انشورنس لا نقدر نشتغل لا نقدر نعيش حياتنا الطبيعية بهذا ال... بهاي السنة ال... الأسائل أوفيس أعطتنا ورقة إنه إحنا إليجبل إنه نبقى داخل أمريكا so within that year, until they got the second interview, um, they got a paper saying they could still live in the United States, but they didn't have any insurance. The money that they came with from Iraq was, was done. They finished all of it. 
واعطونا ورقة انه احنا eligible نبقى داخل امريكا بس هاي الورقة وين ما نروح بيها لأي دائرة لأي منظمة ما حد ما حد شايف هاي الورقة وما حد معترف بهاي الورقة فأنا زوجي أصلا هو مريض عنده انفلمنتري باول ديزيز ودايابيتيك عانينا كثير لا انشورنس الأدوية كلش اكسبنسيف الصحة مع زوجي صارت داون مستشفيات ما تقبل تصرف لنا دكاترة ما تقبل تسوي لنا شيء Um, so after they got, um, you know, like approval for their asylum status, they tried applying for jobs, um, but all of all of the places they applied for um, said that this, like, there was no ID. It just was a paper that said you have asylum status, but there was no ID. There was no so no one, no one, no one, um, you know, gave them any kind of authorization to work. And during that time, her husband was also very sick. He was very ill, and they didn't have any insurance, um, and they weren't able to, to you know. Yeah, pay the expenses. Um, so they said to go to emer the emergency room um, and to kind of just deal with it, deal with it there. جت بعد بعد هذا الفترة أنا طبعا ولدت فابني من إجى على الدنيا إنه الدي إتش إس سمحت بس الابن يأخذ فل كفر إنشورنس لأن هو سيتيزن عطت مساعدات بس الابن حتى يقدر إنه يعيش لأن إحنا كنا زيرو إنكم بس إحنا بهاي الفترة كثير تعذبنا كثير نفسيتنا تعبت بهاي السنة اللي فاتت. Uh, بعد مرور سنة جتينا الانترفيو جتينا موعد المقابلة رحنا سوينا الانترفيو كملنا uh, بعد هاي المقابلة الكلوك مال الورك اثرايزيشن رجع اشتغل مرة ثانية فاحنا من من تاريخ المارش 3 2015 الكلوك رجع صار ستارتد فرح نحسب 150 يوم حتى نقدر نحصل على ورقة عمل ونقدر نشتغل ونقدر نمارس حياتنا نحصل سوشيال سيكيورتي درايفر لايسن اي شيء يثبت انه احنا ميديكال ما نحصل لان احنا ستيل احنا بعدنا نوت اليجبل فبس مجرد انه راح نقدر نعيش حياتنا نقدر نحصل درايفر لايسن سوشيال سيكيورتي ورك اثرايزيشن نقدر نروح نشتغل حتى لو كان اي شغله بس المهم انه الناس تقدر تشغلنا So within that year, her second son was born, and because he's he was born in the United States, he's obviously a United States citizen, and so um, because the family had zero income, so um, they had assistance, but only for the son through food stamps um, and other and other government assistance. Um, so it took about a year, and after that year, um, the the 150 days where you can get a work authorization began again from uh, March 3rd of this year until now, and so now the And uh, بعدين بعد مرور 150 يوم اللي هو صادف uh, بنهاية جولاي احنا قدرنا نسوي applied على work authorization uh, بنهاية شهر الثامن احنا جانا approved انه تجينا ال work authorization وانه نقدر نطلع social security و driver license بس الصدفة صادفت انه من استلمنا ال work authorization احنا بنفس التاريخ استلمنا ال white card اللي هي ال approval على الأسائلة So uh, at the end of August, they finally um, received the work authorization along with the same exact day they received that. They also received asylum status, which, al which allows them to um, get driver's, license, driver's licenses and um, social security cards. Um, yeah. وإحنا من تاريخ واحد تسعة استلمنا الأوراق كاملة. Uh, من واحد عشرة خلينا نقول بدأت إنه الدي إتش إس تصرف لنا الفود ستامب والكاش بدأ إنه حياتنا شوية تستعدل إنه ناخذ إنشورنس بس إحنا الفترة اللي عشناها إنه من دخلنا أمريكا إلى حد إلى حد هاي إلى حد واحد عشرة إحنا كنا مندمرين نفسيا تعبانين uh, فلوسنا خلصت uh, زوجي كان كلش مريض كنت أروح على الدي إتش إس أقل من الدي إتش إس زوجي دا يموت أريد لي إنشورنس كانت تقول لي انه انت بس انطيكي امرجنسي اني تايم تريدين تروحين للامرجنسي روحي بس انا فول كفر ما انطي كل دخله للامرجنسي كان زوجي من يفوت 16000 البول اي اقل للدي اتش اس يعني تدفعون انتم هالمبلغ بالامرجنسي ممكن هذا المبلغ تدفعونه للفيزت للدكتور يكون افضل تقول انه انا ما ادفع احنا بس عندنا الامرجنسي وانا ما بدي اسوي لكم شيء So beginning October 1st is when um, our life in the United States actually began where we were able to apply to different things and get assistance and where we got, you know, assistance with food stamps and other things. So not just for her son, but not for the whole family. But the, the, the year that they spent here when they first came was one of the most difficult years um, of her life. And... Um, Uh, yeah, they were depressed, they didn't have any money, um, 
her husband again was very very ill and so whenever she'd asked DHS for um, insurance for coverage for her husband they said just go to the emergency room and she's saying every time they went to the emergency room the bill was $16,000. Uh, بس احنا بهاي الفتره اللي عشناها الصعبه نشكر الدكاتره اللي قسم منهم ساعدونا انه نروح على البيشنت اسيستنت بروجرام انه ممكن يصرفوا لنا ادويه اتصلوا بالمصانع تبع الادويه خلونا نسوي ابلايد وياهم انه قامت تصلنا الادويه للبيت uh, اشكر الناس اللي ساعدتنا بانه داينا من عندهم فلوس uh, رحنا على الجمعيه الكلدانيه ولو ان احنا ما يحق لنا نقدم ابلايد عند الجمعيه الكلدانيه ما كان عندنا وايت كارد بس انه ساعدونا واتصلوا uh, احنا هسه المفروض انه هسه بدت حياتنا uh, بس رح بس حياتنا هم راح تبقى متوقفه لانه انا مهندسه وزوجي مهندس uh, زوجي اي تي مانجر وبزنس ديفلوبمنت بس بداخل امريكا نقدم على اعمل uh, مدى يوافقون على العمل لانه uh, يريدون المينيمم انه يكون عندي جرين كارد uh, وهذا الشيء صعب انه لحد بعد سنه يلا اقدر احصل على الجرين كارد so she thanks um, the doctors that helped with uh, the, the patient assistance programs and she helps the people who who did as much as they could to help her um, and she, she thanks the Chaldean society for um, yeah, for also giving her assistance even though they didn't have a white card which is asylum status um, no, I think we, we, we need to I want to go to uh, okay. thank you <laughs> thank you very much Thank you. And now I'm going to I'm going to turn now to, uh, to Mustafa Assad. He's uh, Syrian, and he arrived here uh, just June 2015. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mustafa Assad. Good afternoon, my name is Mustafa Assad and his and this is my story of coming of American and coming to be with you today. When the reflection Assad started and the planes began flying over and the bombing began, there was no work to be done. There was no life at all. A person couldn't guarantee his life a hope for even even one day. He couldn't supply food for himself or his family. <coughs> In 2012, my wife Wafa and my daughters I my decided I decided it was time for our family to leave our home in Idlib, Syria and make our way to Turkey. We couldn't bring anything with us, no even our ADs, AD. We left as run away. A man is my village talk for 40 or 50 of, the, of us in his car to Atma camps on the border of Turkey. We wanted all the day all the camp until the Turkish police left and we could cross the border. In Turkey we rented house but the cost of living were high. My daughters Ranin and Russia and even my youngest child worked in a swing factory world I took. Wherever I work I couldn't find it was the only way to be called by for our brain, and uh, the only way to be, to be called eight. A year and a half after we arrived in Turkey, we registered as refugee with the United Nations after many, interviews with the agency of in Ankara and Istanbul. We were applied to able to apply for arrestment in February 2014. Finally, in June of 2015, we arrived in the United States. We have been here in Michigan for four months. When we first get here, the government and organization that brought 
us help it for the three months they paid for rent and give us enough money to get by things are a little hard now that the money has spent it. I'm trying to find work two days a week. I worked with Dr. Basha and that has helped. I see I think it is going to be okay. The kids are the kids are going to school. The entire reason we come here was for with be able to go to school. In Turkey they couldn't it is it has been three years, it is hard for them to establish establishing 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 them surface here and get you used to it. But with time no debit they all get used to it. They have only been going to school for months. They just need time. Going to end from Syria is impossible now. There is no way to know, don't ha know when the war is finished. A year, two years, five years, or ten. My hope is that my kids will learn, go to school, and life safely here so that they can have a future and make the life here. I want them to make la life and future, that's it. We come into America in June, just five months ago, and now our kids are learning again and we are living. And finally, uh, Radia uh, Fakhreddin from uh, Iraq and arrived in 2014. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And as I say in Arabic in every conference, peace be upon you, or assalamu alaikum. I'm from Iraq. And Iraqis passed through very, very severe and difficult situations and circumstances. I have very nice house in Iraq and I have a car and I have a nice job there. I was project manager in the IRC. But as you know, there, there, is, there was and there is terrorism in Iraq. Kidnapping, unexpected explosions, killing, shortage of electricity, or there is no electricity, just by the generators. Dark future for my children. So, I submit my application to the IOM. And as I worked with the three organizations, and these organizations were headed by American managers, they accepted my application. I left everything behind me, behind me. My belongings, my house, my job, everything. And I traveled. They accepted me, the IOM, but rejected my husband. He's now alone in Baghdad. I hope to see him. Then, I traveled to Amman. The IOM welcomed uh, me and my sons and my daughter there and give their directions. And uh, then we go to Chicago. The IOM welcomed us and directed us to reach our final destination, which is Michigan. When we reached Michigan, the US committee for refugee and immigrants welcomed us, contacted us, give us their directions and instructions how to be resettled in the American society. Now my 
my youngest son is in the high school. My son, the middle son, or in between them, he is uh, teaching and learning the English language as a second language, ESL. And my daughter now is in the college. She is learning the English language as second language. But I have no job now. The U.S. Committee for Refugee and, Refugee and uh, Immigrants supported us for the first three months and paid the rent of our house and supported us for the second three months. But now, I'm doing my best to find a suitable job for me to earn our living and to live a nice living here. We come here to search for peace, security, a nice future for my son. And I find it here. It is a, a nice city, secure and peaceful. That's what we lost in Iraq. It is a very nice country, very nice country, but terrorism destroyed it. That's my story. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer it. Is, um, is Lavinia here? Yeah. I was looking. She left. Oh, she had to leave. Okay. Then I'm going to turn to you. Okay? And I want to turn to Jen and I want to turn to Annie, too. I have three questions, and you can take them, um, each one of you, one of them. One is um, about each one. Is it um, separating a spouse? Um, I don't understand that, how that happens. Um, the second is the, 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 the story that we, we heard at first about the, um, the layers and layers and in, in, in flexibility of the process of, of DHS that, uh, that ends up becoming as, uh, as, as uh, burdensome and and inflexible uh, as as it is, and thirdly, um, the the issue that that was raised here about the children um, and their after three years of no schooling, three years of being traumatized, um, the acclimation. How long does it take um, for them, to, the kids, to 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 work through that? Can I start in the back with 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 Annie? Would you? Take one of those, maybe the, the last one, um, what you've seen. Uh, in terms of, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. In terms of you know working with schools on really understanding refugee children and what their specific needs may be, um, but also in terms of working with parents on um, helping them understand sort of how best to help their children transition. Um, on the, I can better comment actually to the uh, DHS question yeah. related to the asylum process and. Um, also just say that uh, you know, the, the immigration courts, I mean, you went through the, um, the asylum office, but the immigration courts at this stage are dysfunctional in that it's taking two, three, sometimes more years um, for asylum seekers to even have their merits hearings scheduled. Mm -hmm. And at times when uh, you know, a date needs to be rescheduled or there's an issue or a continuance was asked for, it could be rescheduled for another year, 18 months in the future, which maintains long-term separation from families, prevents people from kind of moving forward in their lives, may prevent them from having work authorization for extended periods of so time. So was pretty lucky that it went this quickly. 
<laughs> I don't want to say that, no, no, um, yeah. though, uh, though there are domestically, kind of earlier today we were talking about problems overseas that we need to correct with slow processing times yeah. and resettlement, but domestically in terms of the functioning of both DHS as well as the immigration courts, a lot needs to be done in order Thank to you. serve people's needs. Thank you. Let me come down here to Jen. She's going to bring the mic. Thank you. In terms of the overseas refugee screening process, uh, you're absolutely right. It takes entirely too long. About 10 years ago, that process took more like between nine and 12 months for someone to come through, which is still a very long time. And now we're seeing many cases take between two to three years to come through. And a lot of that is because we've layered more and more and more security checks on top of an already very robust system without really looking at where there might be duplicative efforts. Um, also, they're lined up in a sequence that doesn't always work out because each part of the sequence the biometric check, the biographical name check, the medical screening, the interagency check, the in-person interview with the Department of Homeland Security officer, all of those have different validity periods between 12 and 18 months. And so you can imagine as a family, if one person has to redo a medical um, screening because maybe they were giving birth at that time or maybe they were sick when the medical screening was first taken place, then the clock starts ticking. So then the other family member, maybe their interview with the Department of Homeland Security expires. And everyone is caught in a consistent, constant loop or domino effect of expiring validity periods. And I think that could have been the case, although I don't know the specific situation, where you do have someone who cannot actually leave and travel with their family because they're caught in that expiring validity period situation. And so they have to um, separate off cases, which is very, very devastating to the families involved. So it shows the need for more resources for the Department of Homeland Security to process this screening. The Department of Homeland Security gets more money every year they're getting tons and tons and tons of more money on immigration enforcement efforts, and money is not going to the screening process for refugees and asylees. And this is a big problem. Those programs are funded through fees, through immigration fees, not through appropriations through Congress. And so this just, I think, shows the need for a groundswell of pressure on the US government to provide more capacity for refugee screening so it doesn't take that long, and also to be held accountable that it's just not acceptable. We've had State Department and Homeland Security folks say, well, that's just the way it is. It just takes three years. Families just get separated. That's not an acceptable answer, and we, they need to hear that from us, and Congress needs to hear that from their constituents to put pressure on the administration. Thank you. And now I'm going to make you walk all the way up there, and I'm going to ask a different, a different question, actually, that I'd like you to comment on. Um, one of the things that's constant here is that initial support for a couple of months uh, for resettlement, and then over, and, uh, and therefore the problem of both health care, employment, uh, and basic survival issues. Um, what is being done to help find jobs, to help find uh, ways for refugees to not only resettle, but also become uh, self-supporting um, and, 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 and to be able to care for their families? I think it's a uh, resettlement process definitely is not an easy job, but I think in our country here, we have probably the best resettlement programs in the world. And I'm talking uh, on behalf of all the resettlement agencies, not only USCRI. Uh, it's really difficult to find jobs. The, the expectations are really high, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to do everything within 90 days. And sometimes it's not easy to get the paperwork, get the social security, get all the documentations, and at the same time, enroll them in ESL classes, and then find them jobs. Now, even though I'm saying this, we as resettlement agencies have really excellent numbers in regard to employment. Uh, U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants in Detroit 
uh, in 2014, we're still waiting for 2015 numbers, employment numbers, but through our matching grant program, we employed in 2014 uh, 77% of the people that we enrolled in, in the matching grant. And I think that's really uh, a number that I'm proud of. And I think the other resettlement agencies, Lufu, the Catholic uh, uh, resettlement agencies, also they have similar numbers. So we are doing, I think we're doing excellent jobs. Now, Rodia, uh, of course, you did wonderful. We did find a job for her son. And she is uh, employable, but unfortunately, it's we need some more time, probably, and uh, the 180 days expire, and we're still working with Rodea to find a job. But uh, I think uh, for Mustafa, you are, I believe you're working, you started working part-time, and uh, you arrived in uh, late July, I believe. So, and the paperwork, and uh, dealing with DHS issues, dealing with the... Uh, uh, you know, the health screenings, everything, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to do everything within 30 days of arrival. I think the environment in, in Michigan is really great, and I am very optimistic about resettling more Syrian refugees in the coming month and coming years. Uh, the support is coming from the government office, it's coming from the Detroit mayor office, I mean, we're going to see, and the community is doing great, the Syrian community in uh, so many counties, in Oakland County, in Washington County, we have uh, communities all over Michigan that are really contacting us and asking for ways to help. So we just have to, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging job, but I think overall, uh, all resettlement agencies are doing excellent jobs. And uh, we're hoping that we find jobs for every refugee within, within 180 days. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. We are um, about out of time. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to remain in place. Uh, Governor will be with us in about a half hour. He's here on campus. And uh, I know some students will be coming in. And so if you don't want to lose your seat, it might be smart to, to stay put. I want to thank. Um, the three of you for telling us your story and for being with us. And I want to thank those of you who were with us this morning who spoke uh, uh, about helping to shed some additional light on the, on the circumstances. This is a problem that we're going to continue to talk about for the rest of today. And, uh, and we have Ann Richard with us tomorrow, the Assistant Secretary. Um, it's a problem we're committed to continuing to work on um, throughout the, the coming the coming years. It's it's a it is as was expressed today uh, um, an unprecedented in our lifetime crisis. And our country's response so far, while good in terms of the cases we've dealt with to some extent, um, has been wholly unacceptable in terms of the numbers we're dealing with. And the allocation of resources, the fact that we don't hire more people to do the screening process, that we don't look at the screening process itself, um, and that we haven't dealt with the reality of the fact that this isn't going away. It's going to continue to grow and get worse, and frankly, we're not ready. We're not ready to deal with it. Meanwhile, real people are paying a real price. Uh, and we need to both be aware of it, understand it, and then be as supportive and compassionate as we can. So thank you all. We'll be back with the governor in about a half hour.